It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three chief ministers over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the chief ministers and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the chief ministers and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these chief ministers and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal ministers, prefects, satraps, advisers and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so it cannot be altered, in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room, where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being, except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sunset to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation may not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near to the lion's den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. 
for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me pray as we begin. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is alive and at work. I pray that you would um, take my words and that um, something of you would be heard and anything that is not from you would just fall away. Amen. Uh, good evening, everyone. We are continuing our series, Dare to be a Daniel. Everyone knows the premise of the game, Truth or Dare, right? Don't worry, we're not just going to play like a giant game of Truth or Dare for the rest of the night. But basically, you're sat with a group of friends, and in turn, individuals are asked whether they would like to share a truth to answer a question that's chosen by friends, or take on a usually embarrassing or risky challenge. To be honest, the main reason for playing this game, in my experience, was to find out who so-and-so fancied or some other secret. However, there were other individuals who found this very boring and would much prefer the game to be centered around high-stake dares. Many a time, someone has been dared to stand on a table or chair at school and shout something blush-worthy, lick the bottom of someone else's shoe, or run around their uni courtyard in their underwear. For something to be considered a good dare, there has to be an element of risk. It has to have a level of sacrifice, even if that is just your dignity. It has to be something out of the ordinary that if someone wasn't compelling you to do so, you wouldn't usually consider it. As we've explored the story of Daniel, and as I prepared for this talk, it became clear that beyond the pleasing alliteration of the sermon series title, to dare to be a Daniel is a perfect example of a great and outrageous dare. To be a Daniel in our own context is risky. It takes sacrifice. And if we weren't called into it by our faith in Jesus, we would likely opt out. The good news is that where there is little to no fruit from the usual truth or dare games, we witness through his story that daring to be a Daniel leads to life and freedom. Today we're looking at the theme of faithfulness throughout Daniel 6. So through this evening, let's keep asking ourselves, do we dare to be faithful? As we said, for a dare to be considered a good dare, it has to be somewhat risky. Daniel was no stranger to risking it all for his faith. If you haven't been here the last couple of weeks or need a recap, here's some background for you. Daniel was taken from his birthplace, Jerusalem, and lived in exile in Babylon. This happened under Nebuchadnezzar's reign. I just really wanted to say that name at the front, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, we read in Daniel 1 that he was considered a fit, handsome young man with an aptitude for all types of learning. As part of God's chosen people, the Jews, he and his friends, who were taken from Jerusalem, refused to eat the rich food that the king had assigned them, a move that made the guard looking after them fear for his life in case the king were to notice. However, they were found to be stronger than any of the men who had eaten the royal food. Later, through his God-given wisdom, he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dreams when everyone else failed to or were too afraid to for fear of having to share bad news. Throughout his time serving the kings of Babylon, he did so loyally, yet was uncompromising in his lifestyle and in speaking the truth from God. Daniel served five kings after King Nebuchadnezzar, his son, King Belshazzar, reigned. And when he was slain, King Darius ruled over Babylon. And this is where our story picks up tonight. God's favor was with Daniel. 
he achieved and excelled in what was asked of him. He had been considered strong, intelligent, good-looking, and successful. Daniel, who, remember, was in exile, had risen in favor amongst the kings of Babylon. His God-given wisdom had helped steer these leaders, so much so that Darius, having placed him in charge of the satraps, was considering setting him over the whole kingdom. We might guess that it was for these reasons, due to jealousy and envy, that the satraps and administrators were so set against him. They had such hatred and bitterness for him that they plotted to kill him. However, whilst Babylon benefited from Daniel's integrity and wisdom, there was one thing that the satraps and administrators could not stand. Daniel, who served Babylon with integrity and humility, remained faithful to the God of Jerusalem. Daniel believed that salvation would come from the God of Jerusalem, and he made no secret of this. Keeping the Jewish laws, praying and worshipping only God, Time and time again throughout his life, he had shown that he would bow to no other. His depth of faithfulness to God was so significant that it was offensive. It can be argued that it was his unswerving belief in God that led others to plot his death. Try as they might, the satraps and administrators could find no fault with Daniel's conduct. Verse 5, we will never find any basis for charges against the man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. They thought that they had found Daniel's weakness, his faith. They knew that he would not compromise his belief in God as the one true God. So believing this to be Daniel's weakness, they appealed to what Darius perceived as his strength, his image, standing and influence. Verse 6, they go to King Darius saying, issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days except to you, O king, will be thrown into the lion's den. We see in this story that what they considered a gap in Daniel's armour, what they thought would bring him down, his dependence on God, was actually his strongest suit and what ended in raising him up. What Darius considered his strength, his reputation, pride, and control was crippling and led him to be trapped by the satraps and administrators. Daniel's faithfulness to God was so offensive to the satraps and administrators that despite being a man of integrity and humility who served their kingdom, they hunted him down, perverting justice and truth in order to have him killed. Remaining faithful was a risky choice for Daniel. But we shouldn't be surprised that his faithfulness received this response. Jesus, the only blameless individual to walk this world, was hounded, hunted, and crucified by means of perverted justice. And Jesus himself warns us that those who follow him will experience persecution and hardship. Remaining faithful to God is risky. We aren't always going to be able to agree with our neighbor. We won't always be able to avoid conflict. We might not share in popular opinion. There may be times we risk looking like a fool. We could lose relationships or positions. And for some Christians, they are still risking their whole lives by remaining faithful to God. But we, like Daniel, have a choice. We, like Daniel, are exiles. We don't belong in this world. In John 15, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and says, As it is, you do not belong to the world. When he's praying for the believers later in John, Jesus again prays, They are not of this world, even as I am not. And Paul writes in Romans, Do not conform to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Just as Daniel didn't truly belong to Babylon, we do not belong to this world, but are to set our eyes on the kingdom of God. Daniel provides us with an excellent example of how to live in the world, but not of it. He was trusted by the Babylonians. He was loyal to Babylon. He had done everything he could to be considered a citizen there. However, his eyes were fixed firmly on God. 
He was unswerving in his dedication to God's laws, and those who knew Daniel knew his priority was God. It was why the satraps could count on Daniel being thrown in the lion's den if it depended on his faithfulness to God. Daring to have a faith like Daniel is as risky as it gets. When Daniel heard that the satraps and administrators were plotting, what was his response? If it had been me, I would have spent almost every moment stressed and worried, not being able to focus on my job, my friends or family. I would probably have spoken for hours and hours with anyone who would listen to my worries and fears going over every single detail. Or instead, maybe I would lash out at those trying to help or comfort me. I might have tired myself out and decided to sleep it all off and pretend it would go away, turn to a bit of retail shopping, Netflix binging, or anything to take my mind off it all. But Daniel continued to pray. Verse 10. He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Being exiled from Jerusalem and the temple destroyed, Daniel could no longer go there to dedicate himself to God. So he opened his window facing the direction of Jerusalem and he prayed three times every day and trusted God. Daniel's faithfulness was not a spur of the moment thing. To remain faithful in such moments, these practices must become a part of who we are. And we can't do that without the discipline to build habits. The practice of being faithful is created in the normal, mundane moments. It's the small wins. One commentary put it this way, having made the habit such an integral part of himself, he would have betrayed himself as well as his God if he had not opened his windows and got on his knees. I was listening to a podcast earlier this week and I felt doubly convicted Not only was I reading about Daniel's incredible faithfulness to God, but it seemed this message was finding its way through to me in other ways. The question is, are we faithful in the moments when we don't want to be? Do we choose to press into God when things are boring, rubbish, or overwhelming? On this podcast, they said, we can justify the way we are thinking or acting. But is it in accordance with how God is calling us to think and do life? I'm driving along in my car and I feel like I've been hit in the face. I'd heard myself far too frequently over the week justify why I'm not in the mood to press into God's word or spend time praying or listening. But was it really in accordance with how God is calling me to think and do life? Am I being faithful to God in that moment? The podcast went on to say, biblical faith looks reality in the face and does not flinch because we know that our God is so much bigger than what we are walking through. Daniel did not flinch in the face of death because through his faithfulness that did away with excuses and was obedient to God's call, he knew God was bigger than anything he would walk through. How can we be faithful to God in our daily habits? How can we build momentum and discipline that propels us through the hard times in life, that we can look reality in the face without flinching because we know that God is so much bigger? Which brings us on to our final point of tonight. We've talked about Daniel's faithfulness, but we can't talk about the lion's den and not reflect on its testimony to God's faithfulness which is the motivation for our faithfulness in him. Motivation to return his goodness and mercy with faithful lives and hearts. I've not really beaten around the bush tonight. Being faithful is hard and risky and takes sacrifice. But our motivation that we serve a God who calls us daily into relationship with him, our God who can even close the mouth of hungry lions. Despite all of the king's efforts, Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. Just as when Jesus was crucified, those plotting against Daniel made sure that Daniel would face the same process of execution as all others did at the time. 
even rolling a stone over the entrance so as to make sure nothing could be changed. But we know that stones placed over entrances aren't too much of an issue for God, and neither, apparently, are lions. The next morning, when Darius called into the den, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, who you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done wrong before you, O king. Even in this exchange, we see Daniel's faithfulness affirmed. Darius recognizes that Daniel continuously serves God. Daniel is still ready to serve the king, saying, O king, live forever, but immediately shares the testimony of how it was the power of God who spared him. Daniel is lifted out of the den, and we read in verse 23, no wound was found on him because he had trusted God. Isn't that a challenge? Am I trusting in God that he is all I need and will provide all I need? Are you trusting in God or holding on to fear, distracting yourself or attempting to hide from reality? Daniel teaches us once again that faithfulness to God means that we need not fear, but trust in him. It's true that not many of us will face the lion's den, but we will face hardships and trials, whether these be persecution or oppression from the enemy who is set against our faithfulness to God. There's a battle. The story of the lion's den is a reminder that God is bigger than it all. Faithful in the fire and faithful in the lion's den. He is sovereign over creation, shutting the mouths of hungry lions. Where there seemed to be inevitable death, there is life. Those that falsely accused Daniel met an awful end, just in case we doubted what the lions were capable of. The chapter ends with Darius declaring the power of God, that Daniel's God endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And finally, verse 28. Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. The kings came and went. Kingdoms succeeded and fell. But the faithfulness of Daniel remained. His faithfulness to God led to freedom and life. So, Daniel 6, here's our truth. Faithfulness is costly. It takes sacrifice. But being faithful to an ever-faithful God means that we have assurance of life over death. And now for our dare, dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be faithful to God, even when the rest of the world is not for him. Dare to be sacrificial in order to build enduring faithfulness through our habits, so that when the going gets tough, we remain trusting in an ever-faithful God. And praise God for his faithfulness, that we know he is bigger than anything that we are facing. Let me pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for Daniel's example. I pray that you would stir in our hearts the ways that we can be faithful to you. Lord, we're sorry for the ways that in the past we may have chosen an easier route. But I thank you that through your Holy Spirit, you empower us to go out, to be faithful to who you are, to share truth and to share life. I pray that you would empower each one of us this week to look how we can be disciplined to build habits that um, put you first in our lives, that will build that faithfulness um, in our hearts, that whatever we face in life, we can trust that you are bigger than it all. Amen.